gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Harlan Sten, who is from Chicago, which is great, and it turns out we like the same pizzeria. Uh, he's presenting me, NTP, the NTP Project, and the N Network Time Foundation. How we got here, welcome to my hallucination. Are you sure it wasn't the drugs? You sure it wasn't the drugs causing hallucinations? It oh, was time. We'll find out. Okay. Um, <laughs> Harlan is the president and project manager at the Network Time Foundation. You'll see a pictorial description of Harlan's job on the screens with apologies to Randall Monroe of XKCD. Harlan is a nearly 50 year veteran of the IT industry interested in issues surrounding timekeeping on computers since the early 80s, he's fixed, improved, and contributed to the network time protocol for over 40 years. In mid-2011, Harlan started, sorry, Harlan um, started Network Time Foundation with a mission to provide direct services and to support and improve the state of accurate computer network timekeeping. Can you tell me all about uh, PTPP later? Sorry, my ears suck. Can you tell me about Precision Time Protocol later too? Yes. Cool. Um, NTF continues to work with several time-related projects and has new projects in the works, including Kronos and the Sync e packages. Harlan, welcome to the Nanog stage. Thank you very much, sir. Hi. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you all very much. I think I start with this. So I call it my hallucination because sometime in the 80s or 90s, I was reading uh, some of the books by Bandler and Grinder about neurolinguistic programming. And I understood them to say each of us really lives on our own hallucinations. And their point is they're really, and I'm only going to do this very rarely because I know y'all can read. There are really only two distinctions between anybody in this room and an institutionalized schizophrenic. One of them has to do with whether or not you have a good reality strategy, and you can make that distinction. And the second is whether or not the content of your hallucinations is socially acceptable and, uh, or not. And because you all hallucinate, we hallucinate that somebody's having a good day or a bad day. Uh, and it really is an Sometimes it's an accurate representation of what's going on, and sometimes it's not. But it isn't necessarily real. So I noticed on the one hand, I kind of like these definitions, but, and I mostly agreed with them. But on the other hand, they felt off to me because it's really a matter of perspective. I wondered if there might be a better word than hallucination. So I thought about delusions. And then I looked at the definition of these things. A hallucination is an experience involving the apparent perception of something which is not present, and that edges me a bit. And a delusion is an idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic belief or impression that is firmly maintained, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, I don't really like either of these things. In the first one, I'm not thrilled with the apparent perception because I don't believe I have a level of awareness to know what is perceivable by other folks, and a lot of times I'm misperceiving things myself. And in the second one, I don't really like it because generally accepted as, as reality or a rational argument, it seems bluntly irresponsible to me. I'm not in a position to know this stuff. So let me clear this out a little bit to make it easier. So. Let's try here. The general accepted reality is there, and the reason why I say this is a lie is a lie even if everybody believes it. And the truth is the truth even if nobody believes it. So this goes to the sort of stuff I'm having trouble with. I still think about this a fair amount. Words and language are important to me because it goes to how we communicate with each other and how we then, uh, the communication between folks and then the understanding we have to go and then build upon it. So this clarity increased for me when I heard the phrase, communication is the effect it has on the other person. That one really hit home to me, uh, especially when I, like most everybody else I know, 
can feel so misunderstood when I say something that is so clear and obvious to me, and I get a deer in the headlights from somebody else. I also like to be amused, and I like to amuse others. We should be hearing sounds. Isolating a secretion of the foreheadial lobe. The foreheadial lobe? Foreheadial gland, whatever it is. The gland I've discovered in the forehead. Oh, I didn't know you did that. Well, that's good. Yes, yes, but now I've extracted what it secretes or excretes. And what does it secrete or excrete? Let's just call it for now foreheadazine. So that clip, I, uh, I got permission, I won't say what I said up there, but you know, thank you and I'm glad I was able to use it. Um, to prep for this talk, I asked them about what language is appropriate for me to use up here. And we had some discussions around it and sadly the first thing that came to my mind is what movie rating am I striving for? And as soon as those words came out of my mouth, I realized I shouldn't have said that because I don't know what language is appropriate for my movie ratings anymore. I haven't thought about that for a movie I've watched in a long time. So the feedback I got was I was told it was okay to say the word sucks, which is good because I'm happy to use that word frequently, and I could say F-bomb, but I couldn't say the actual word. And I was also told I should avoid, avoid both sexual innuendo and I should also avoid violence. And on the violence thing, my, when I heard avoid violence, the first thing I go to is, well, what's a violent thing I would possibly say? And the one that popped into my head was the phrase about two birds. And I realized, yes, that's clearly violent. And other folks have said that it's violent too. And they recommended, uh, let's see, where am I? So let's try it here. The phrase, the phrase, feed two birds with one scone, is, is certainly less violent than the other one. Except, what about gluten intolerant birds? I mean, sooner or later, you go down this path, you see new things, you make new choices, you gotta decide what's okay and what wasn't, and what was okay yesterday is not okay today. So you gotta figure out it's all about boundary exploration and how do you titrate these boundaries to see where they are. But before you can do that, you have to actually identify what the new boundary conditions are. It's, it's a thing. So with that in mind, um, there is a point to what I've been saying and with any luck it'll start to become clear. For me, the goal, and Dave Mills, because I asked him about that, people assume NTP is about setting the clocks which is true, but it has to maintain the time. And when I asked Dave for a quick summary of what is the actual core goal of NTP, he said NTP is all about a well-defined response to an impulse. And that impulse is changing the time. So that could be a, sl a slight adjustment, or if you wake up and say, gee whiz, my clock is wrong, I'm gonna jump it ahead, I'm gonna make a big step on it. So the overall philosophy on this is we do the right things in the right places, not too much, not too little. It's doing, it's taking a high level overview to make sure the things you do are generally correct. Because as you get a bigger system of systems trying to communicate back and forth about time, as Dave has learned through decades of painful experience, as he will say, all of a sudden somebody does a little something and the next thing you know the wheels fly off the bus. So, to me it's sort of like this. This is a tensegrity structure. And that's clean, it's simple, and there's parts that just manage to make the right thing happen. If anything is too weak or too heavy or does the wrong thing, it's not going to stay up. And, and time is all about my take on time, which happens to apparently match with Dave's, is you gotta do these things in the right way just to make sure things stay and behave in the general case. So, starting off on me, this is the 1960s for me. So, I was younger, if you can believe that. Uh, I was hypervigilant 
I learned to be hypervigilant at a very young age. And just to be clear, I paid attention to everything. I knew, if I was in a room with folks, I knew where all the stuff was in the room. I knew who walked in the room. I, I memorized their clothing. Uh, I knew the sounds. I was hypervigilant about everything. I also had a really great memory, and that was cultivated because well, bluntly, it was a survival technique for me. It's how I wanted to you know, move through the day and not get into trouble and be appreciated and all the rest of it. So that was a, a thing for me. I also learned to be pretty intuitive. Uh, I'm introverted, believe it or not. I'd much, my idea of a good time is not being around people. Um, along with, uh, I tried to find patterns and connections with everything. Because if I could find patterns and connections with stuff, I could figure out how it was put together, I could predict how things were going to react, and I could then move forward and have a successful experience with something. I did, if I came across a behavior that didn't fit my built-up model, I just paid more attention, got more information, and if I adjusted my model, that meant I just dismantled the old one, installed the new one, and I would move forward from that location at that point on. It's effectively an exercise in tweaking local, a locally optimal solution for all sorts of fun things. I did a lot of reading when I was a kid, and I continued that I was able to keep reading for pleasure until well into my 40s. Um, if I had more, if I was doing less work, then I'd be, have even more time and I'd keep doing reading, but that hasn't happened in a while. Um, there was a time in my early high school days where I kind of ran out of stuff to read, and my folks had bought a 22-volume encyclopedia, so I read all of it, cover to cover. And uh, I have a memory, so I, people would say things and I'd flash back to the page of the encyclopedia, and I had the information there. It was cool. From the time I was a little kid, people also said I was bright, which sort of didn't make any difference to me because A, I heard it a lot, B, it didn't mean they treated me any differently, it didn't seem to be good for anything, but it did mean that when I saw something, I was able to usually able to figure it out and then predict the next step or do something appropriately. But it's, uh, who cares? I mean, that and, well, these days, $5 will get you a cup of coffee. Uh, the other thing I discovered when I was growing up that, that Authority figures around me didn't like it when I was spontaneous for any length of time. And since that got me negative feedback, what I basically learned to do was be weird. Because being weird happens in a real short snippet, and I say something that may, you know, stun somebody out of their normality, and I said it and I'm done, and that was the extent of my spontaneity back then. Uh, I got really good at being weird. And I would look for opportunities saying, ooh, here's this thing, what can I do to say that will freak somebody out? Not necessarily an ideal strategy for a lot of situations, but it you know, kept me entertained. 70 to 74, still that kind of good stuff. In high school, I noticed there were two classes of people, folks who liked geometry and folks who liked algebra. And they didn't, it, it was interesting, they, they were sure that they preferred one and the other one caused them difficulty. Uh, there may have been a group of people who didn't get either, but I behaved like enough of an elitist jerk back then that if you didn't like either one of them, I wasn't going to pay attention to you anyway. And now that I think about it, if there are groups of people who, have, who are very facile with both algebra and geometry, that's possible. I never, nobody ever identified that way to me, so I never really thought about that one. Um, what else is exciting here? Somewhere in the 70s, I started reading the books by Carlos Castaneda. I really liked the way he wrote and his insights, and I would read, the book, read whatever he had written from the first book to the last book. I would dog ear a page if, if he said anything that I thought was really memorable and interesting, and I'd just keep cycling through them every time he published the new book. I'd add it to the list. When he finished his seventh book, The Fire From Within, that's where I first saw the elucidated concept of the unknown being different from the unknowable. And that really spoke to me, because in the past there was, you know, stuff you knew and stuff you didn't know. 
And I didn't really care that in the pile of stuff I didn't know was stuff that was impossible to ever know. And that refined a model I had. So uh, the, other, the next aspect there is about this time I decided that if I was going to be happy, I needed to do something perfectly. And that I was going to strive for perfection in everything I did. And that was an interesting goal and it, you know, ground me down for a while. I also, that was also the time I came up with my favorite Between the Lines Bible quote. Blessed are those who get what they deserve, which I think is a lovely thing to say because it's kind of non-judgmental and it cuts both ways, which is really kind of pleasant for me. So um, somewhere in the late 70s, I ended up reading The History of Rasselas, Prince of Abyssinia by Samuel Johnson. And I love the way Dr. Jack, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson writes too. He it's a different style because he wrote it in the late 1700s and he uses a lot of double negatives. Uh, there are times I'll have to reread what he says several times just to let it sink in because he'll say a short sentence. Something like, I'm sure I have a quote in here I wanted to tell you. Uh, one of the sentences he read that I really liked was, subsequence does not imply consequence. And it's, that's short. I mean, it's five words. But I hear it, and I think about it, and I go, what exactly is he saying? And I have to think about it, and I go, yeah, you're right. Just because something happened after something else doesn't mean that there was any sort of causal relationship there. And I didn't mind that he sometimes repeated himself in his other works. In a different context, he was, he was talking about something another physician said, and he wrote, it is incident to physicians, I am afraid, beyond all other men, to mistake subsequence for consequence. But it's true in, every, in, in other fields as well. Getting back to computer stuff, I started programming in high school. I got my first programming job the summer of my first year in college and managed to spend the bulk of my entire junior year working on an open source project for online medical records. It was the computer stored ambulatory record, which was something done by Harvard Community Health Plan and Mass General and somebody else. And since I was already comfortable being a programmer by that time and I was doing a lot of work either in medical records or you know laboratories or things like that or business, I figured the easiest way for me to communicate with my client base without going to medical school was to get a degree in business. So at college they tell me I can be an accounting major or an economics major. And the accounting major means I'm going to be doing all coursework, and if I get a degree in economics, I have to write a big paper. Being no fool, I went, I don't want to write the paper, I'll take the coursework. So that was great. The other thing I realized is that the primary difference between the accounting folks and the economics folks is the economics folks don't put numbers on the graphs, on the axis of their graphs. And to me, that always felt a little loose, and I, I liked better precision in, in what I was doing on. So I went for the accounting. As I'm about to go to, to graduate, a couple of professors asked me if I want to go into graduate school, and I went, sure. One suggested I apply to CU Boulder, the other one suggested I apply to Washington University in St. Louis. Since my undergraduate work was in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I grew up in Chicago, I really liked the Colorado climate and the things I could do there and the fun I had. So I was really looking forward to this choice, except I applied to CU Boulder, and, uh, oh, hang on, before I do that one, I was never moved by the proverb, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, because I don't really understand what worth is. It's a little too general. If you get russet potatoes, those are one to four potatoes per pound, and you can get a 50-pound bag of potatoes for 40 bucks. But, so that's 80 cents a pound. But if you go out and you buy a pound of potatoes, that's a buck 15. So the better value is in the 50-pound sack of potatoes. But then you got a 50-pound sack of potatoes, and you got to store them, and you got to eat them, and you got to manage them. So this concept of where is the worth in all this gets a little fuzzy for me. 
There's just too many variables in assessing worth. So that's when I decided that an ounce of prevention is cheaper than a pound of cure because that focuses it in on something that, you know, makes a difference. And in hindsight, cheaper is the wrong word. An ounce of prevention is less expensive than a pound of cure. So moving on to 79 to 80, which would be my grad school years, I took my first computer science class in grad school. CU Boulder wrote back to me and said, we'd love to have you, you need more math. And Wash U in St. Louis sent me back saying, we'd love to have you. Being no fool, I went, I'm going to give up all the wonderful things in Boulder and I'm going to go to the place where they didn't tell me I needed more math. So I show up the first day, they shake my hand and say, we're glad to see you. By the way, you need more math. Oh, well, what can you do? Grad, the grad school wants to know if I want to do the course option or the thesis option. And they say, I need to do the thesis option if I want to go for a PhD. Being no fool, I say, I'll do the course option. And one of the reasons for that is that the, the school had a bunch of PhD candidates in there. And they've been working on their PhDs for somewhere between five and 15 to 18 years. I did not want to be the guy who stayed in grad school for a long time, so I went for the course option. Somewhere in this period of time, I probably met Dan Gear uh, as a result of my association with the CoStar project. And I mentioned that just to drop the name and to show the interconnections of stuff between time. So 1980 to 81 is where I started, uh, I did a, my first, last, significant employee gig. And uh, that was for a big hospital in St. Louis. I was in charge of their clinical lab department. And I started submitting language, software language proposals and standards uh, proposals to, to folks around that. One of the things I did while I was working at the hospital is I wanted, we were very concerned about database caching and things like that. And I, there was much discussion about the algorithms you'd use to retire buffers from the cache and how much cache do you need and things like that. And I said, I've got a great idea. I've got this giant lab computer here with you know gazillions of stations out there, I'm going to timestamp the request and location and size of every record that comes through there, and I'm going to measure it. So once I go through this measuring phase, I can go back and replay this against a bunch of different algorithms to see how it goes. A whole bunch of people hated me for 24 hours because I kind of messed up in how I did it, and I didn't. And things were slow for a whole 24 hours, and they they were not happy with me. But I got really great data out of it, and I learned, well, just to summarize it, it does not matter which cash retirement algorithm you use. What matters is you have enough cash. And this is probably no news to anybody in here because you guys have been working with caching and buffers for a really long time. But it was good then, and I didn't know about the ACM transactions on database systems journal back then. If I did, I would have published this, and I think my life would have taken a different turn, which is cool. Um, I moved on from the hospital around 82. Most everything you'll see is still the same. Uh, at that point, I took over a client server database system that was mostly used in medical computing and the rest of it. And I put a lot of effort into making that code portable and efficient. Because at the time, everybody was, who was doing that language implementation was making it work on a specific field, of, a specific brand of computers. And I had a Unix box. It was an Onyx C8000. It, was, it may have had two megs of memory, and I think we could have bumped it to four without a whole lot of trouble. But you know, it was a 19-inch thing, about 5U. It was impressive, but it could do a lot. The language used to be... You used to write software in this language in a 4K partition, 2K of program and 2K of data. And with this Unix thing, I had megabytes. There were all sorts of fun things I could do. So we put a lot of work on there. And um, I'm trying not to say um, and sometimes I'm not succeeding. I ended up porting that code to well over 500 versions of Unix and other operating systems on 80 or 90 different vendors' platforms. And it got to the point where 
if I had a customer who needed something and I was going to get on a plane, I remember getting out of the airport in San Jose, driving to Sun Microsystems, slapping my t meeting an engineer, slapped the tape on the machine, loaded it in, typed make, waited 15 minutes, put the tape on to build for the customer, and I was out of there in under an hour with a fully ported, reasonably well customized version for the operating system that I could send off to the customer. It was great. Also during this time, I was introduced to my next favorite author. I was at a party at my friend Laura's house, and she had this huge and amazing collection of books that were spread out all around the room. And I was being an introvert sitting in a chair, and she was off somewhere else talking to other friends. As I'm scanning all the titles in the bookshelf, I call out The Snark Out Boys and the Avocado of Death. And she heard me and said, read it, I think you're going to like it. So I borrowed it, read it, liked it very much, and I now have around 90 of Pinkwater's titles. He writes everything from little kids books up to adult and audio books and I think he's awesome and all the people we give them to who have kids say, this is my kid's favorite book, I read it to them and, they, and my kid said, can this be an every night book? That was one of my best feedbacks I got about that. Another thing I wanted to mention here was back in the late 70s, my best friend in college and I realized that we weren't really happy with how our lives were going. We were doing all the right things, going through the motions, but it wasn't particularly satisfying. And we would sign up for seminars and go to trainings and read books, and we'd get a slice of something that seemed like it would make good if only all the ancillary stuff you know, wasn't an issue, but it was. He calls me one day and says, I finally found a seminar that delivers on its promise of how, what's a good way to live your life. I liked it so much, I signed you up for the next course, I got you a plane ticket, and I got you a hotel room. And I went, okay. So I was looking forward to the experience. So uh, where are we here? A couple of weeks later, I flew from St. Louis to Oregon for the seminar, and I trusted him, but I didn't trust the seminar folks, and they shouldn't take it personally. I didn't really trust anybody. I have authority figure issues. So I arrived, and I sat in the back row of the training with my arms and legs crossed because, you know, arr, weird stuff. As I recall, they started at 9 o'clock in the morning, and they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell you what we're going to cover from after the lunch break today until Sunday night. And if you decide you're not interested, go to the front desk at the break. We'll give you your money back, and, you know, thank you for showing up so far. If you come back and you go through the seminar and you leave on Sunday and decide you didn't get great value, we'll give you your money back. But if you leave before, between Thursday lunchtime and Sunday, you're not getting your money back. We very strongly believe in what we're going to tell you, and we, and we figure your time and money are valuable to us. So if you stick it through, we'll give you your money back. If you bail in the middle, we're not going to give you your money back. We're going to cover a lot of material, and it's going to be uncomfortable, and we want to make sure you've got at least a useful anchor to keep you there. So it made perfect sense to me. And the best part about it was, is I'm in this room with, with uh, 88 other partic 87 other participants, and I don't know anybody. I mean, I could say something about my life, and they could hate me and decide I'm a really scummy person. But I'm never going to see them again, so I don't care. So it was really easy for me to go ahead and sit through this thing. So that was lovely, and I didn't know it at the time, but that again was an example of my life as a locally optimal solution. And the thing about locally optimal solution is it's a, high a relative local high point. And to get anywhere away from there, you got to go through garbage. And, you know, I'm trying to keep my nose above this stuff. I don't want to go wallow through it again. But if there's no place easily identifiable better, I'm stuck with a locally optimal solution. So on Thursday afternoon, they talk about ownership and accountability, and we spent a lot of time on the victim, persecutor, rescuer stuff, which I later learned is the Cartman drama triangle. 
And one of the things that became obvious that at least here in, in the Western world, we drive a whole lot of stuff from that model. And it's kind of pervasive. And the trick is that's about getting validation from the outside. And they talk about how each of those roles, victim, persecutor, rescuer, needs the other two roles in order to function. You can't be one, you can't successfully be one without the others to continue and propagate the loop. So they covered that and they also said why there were different models and, what the, and how things would be better. And it made sense to me, so I decided I'd learn about it. Uh, Outside validation, I apologize for this. I wasn't expecting to have to read like this. The, the net takeaway from that is they recommended that we switch to, I am the source of my experience because I get to decide how I'm going to respond to events that happen to me. At the first break, I moved from the back row to the front row and stayed there through most of the, most of the seminar. They also talk a lot about language and how saying, uh, you made me mad when you did this. That's disempowering because you didn't make me do anything. You, you did something, I chose to be angry about it, and I'm blaming you for it. That's useless. That doesn't let me change anything. So I really like that. Thursday night ended with a group exercise with 88 people in it where everybody was heard. So we got out of after 2 in the morning. It was an awesome day, and I really loved it. Friday was a deep dive around vulnerability, which when I heard the word vulnerability, I bridled because vulnerability means weakness. And they said, no, vulnerability means openness. And I said, okay, I can, I can go with that definition. And I realized that I had built up a lot of behaviors around myself to block things out that I didn't want. And that in doing so, I was denying myself sources of feedback and information that would actually be useful. And having spent the previous day dealing with openness and accountability, that suddenly started to make sense with this. And it was all starting to refocus my energies and efforts to getting into someplace useful. So that was a really long day, too, realizing I could be open and I don't have to defend myself because, well, I'm not about to let you offend me or hurt, you know, your reaction isn't going to do anything about me. It says more about you than it does about me. And in a few minutes, I'm actually going to tell you how all this ties together and helps with NTP. Because <laughs> it actually does. Saturday was spent on integrity and the, the premise that the person we break our word to the most is ourselves. I'm going to go to the gym today. I'm only going to eat one cookie. So they covered a whole lot of territory really deeply. It helped me rebuild all my models around behaviors, and I thought it was awesome. Sunday was about spontaneity, something that always gave me trouble, and the reason they shifted it the very first something when they said spontaneity is where joy of life comes from. If something happens and you can deal with it spontaneously, for me, that's, that's a really empowering, happy thing, and I loved it. Uh, when the seminar ended, I went right to the front desk and signed up for their second course. I, my friend who sent me there picked me up, drove me back to his place. His wife, who had also been through the trainings, talked and I talked for hours that night. It was great. The drive home from the seminar was amazing because I was a passenger. And being hypervigilant and stuck in my patterns, when I'm driving, I'm looking ahead. There's a set schedule in which I check left, check right, check behind me, see what's going on. And as a result of the seminar, whenever I would look at something, I would start perceiving all sorts of stuff I never noticed before. And that meant that had I been behind the wheel of a car, I would have driven into something in about 10 seconds. It was a completely messed up my sense of timing. The good news was, after a day, I felt I was able to get enough of a handle on it that I was, I was safe to drive again. So... I've never been interested in recreational chemistry. I, uh, no, no drugs of any kind. I would have at most one beer, maybe a quarter ounce of alcohol, because as soon as I got that far, I'd notice my depth perception changing. And being hypervigilant and eating huge amounts of food because of all the energy that takes, 
If I start altering my perceptions of reality, that's exhausting because it's incredibly overwhelming. I have a hard enough time keeping, event, keeping track of reality as it is. I don't need things messing up my, my incoming perceptions so I can track things. So it's stuff. I get back to St. Louis, went into the office, and my staff noticed how much lighter and happier I was. I walked through the door and said, the business will pay for anybody who wants to do this thing. I think there were about eight people and staff about that time. And they looked and they wanted to see because they could tell it was better, but they didn't know if it was going to stick or anything. They watched me come back from the second seminar even better. Nobody wanted to be the first to go, and my VP, perhaps out of a sense, feeling a sense of duty, decided that he was going to stand up and say, okay, I'll go and do this too, we'll see what it's like. And he came back just beaming, much lighter, much happier, told everybody how awesome it was, and I think almost everybody went through it. I had, you know, with staff turnover, I think I had about 16 people go through the trainings after that point. There was a benefit to this that I did not expect, and the benefit was having had so many people go through the trainings, we all had common language around saying what we, you know, saying what you wanted, knowing that they could believe it, and if somebody said something, you knew they were going to do it, and it made things significantly more productive. Uh, we loved it. At that time, I was a major approval suck. I would do, if you wanted to do something, I would say yes, because I wanted your approval, and I was starting to undo that with the other bits of the training I had. On Sunday mornings, my friend Dave and I used to go to a local restaurant, and I enjoyed it, but I think the drinking water there may not have been great because every time we went there, I would get sick. So I come back after the training and Dave said, hey, you want to go to the usual restaurant? And I stopped and said, no, how about we go somewhere else? And he went, sure. And by the way, I've known you for several years and this is the first time you've ever told me no. Progress. So somewhere in here, I also start studying energy work and kinesiology muscle testing. To me, it's also intuitive in the rest of it. Oh, in the second seminar, I realized perfection, achieving perfection is not possible, at least not for me. And I had the realization, or possibly an epiphany, that I could be perfectly satisfied achieving excellence. Excellence is an attainable goal for me, and I can continue to make imp improvements and refinements on that. So that was a major shift in my life that helped me to be a much happier person. Returning to computers, I did a lot of work on the client-server database thing that I mentioned. I also did a lot of consulting projects. And I used Perl for a whole bunch of things back then. And since I had my database server running on over 500 different plat uh, versions of hardware and software, I really wanted to make the porting process a whole lot easier. So I started using the MetaConfig stuff for Perl, which is where you type, you know, configure with a capital C, and it just does most of the right stuff. But co while configure was great, and I was submitting a lot of patches to it, uh, and I did that to the point where Larry said, Larry Wall said, you're doing this so much, how about if you take over maintenance of the MetaConfig package? I went, okay, that made it that much easier for me to get patches into it. Um, it worked until I said, hey, Larry, I need the next release of Perl. He says, well, as soon as you tell me you've nailed on MetaConfig 2.0, I'll release it. It's like, okay, two weeks later, the next release of Perl was out. It was lovely and wonderful. Autoconf, GNU Autoconf was, not, it was barely a thing just then. And while I liked the fact that it could build in subdirectories uh, and it was completely automated, you didn't need any user interaction, he didn't have, David McKenzie didn't have a lot of fine-grained tests in there. And I would submit patches, and he would reject them, saying, oh, you're testing for silly, stupid things that nobody needs. Well, I'm not nobody, but I guess nobody besides me needs it. That's cool. Um, I got to maintain my local patches for a while on that. And eventually, that David eventually realized that, you know, I may be bleeding edge, but I'm not strangely nuts. So I leveraged all this stuff into consulting gigs and the rest of it where I do porting and configuration for folks. And one of the first places I did this was for a radiation treatment company in St. Louis that, that did all their development work over NFS with uh, 
DEC Digital Equipment Corporation, for those of you who are younger, Hewlett Packard and Silicon Graphics, for those of you who are younger. And so we have several different machines all using NFS. And if you're doing distributed builds, you gotta have accurate time or make isn't gonna know what's newer and what's older. So there were basically two versions of time synchronization available back then, NTP and Vernon Shriver's TimeD program. I looked at them both. And I recall, I hope I remember correctly, it was 30 years ago, that TimeD wanted to be told uh, who to listen to for time. And NTP says, give me a list of servers. I think I am saying I'm going to evaluate the other options I have, and I'm going to choose the ones that I think are correct. And I like that a lot because to me that's accountable behavior. I'm going to assume responsibility for my actions. So NTP uses the Byzantine General's pro, uh, solution for deciding whether or not to, to trust somebody. If you expect N sources to be insane, you better have two N plus one in your pool because that way you're always going to have, the insane folks will always be a minority. And I like that. It's, it, you know, as I mentioned, it's accountable. So I pick NTP as the tool for time sync. We build everything, and the problem with NTP at that time was that it was a tarball. You unpacked it, you manually edited the make file, you manually edited a config.h file, you built it, and you were done. And you built in the source directory. So if you start to have multiple versions of OSs that may not have forward compatibility on their libraries, and if you have multiple machines, you have to have multiple directories. And if you make any change to one of them, you've got bit rot because you may not be propagating those changes to everything else. It was miserable. I really wanted NTP to use GNU AutoConf so I could have a single source copy. I could build in subdirectories on each machine. I'd have a single always updated set of the source code and it would work. So until we could get to GNU AutoConf and make since I was running NTP on all these platforms, I started to send Dave Mills lots and lots of patches for things, which he appreciated. And at some point, he decided I was helpful enough that I should, help, I should be part of the project. And depending on what you want to call it, I either became his baby's babysitter, or the janitor of time, or perhaps the nanny of time. One of those things, it's not really that important to me. In 96 June, I asked Dave if he wanted me to convert the NTP code base to AutoConf, and he said, sure. So I, th I did that, and about two months later, I had it all finished, and that's when I stepped in it. I gave the, copy to, I gave the code to Dave, I told him how to use it, and said, let me know. A day or so later, he came back and said, that's really great, I like this. By the way, I didn't want to step on your toes while I was doing this, so I've got this queue of patches over here. Would you please apply them? I went, sure. So that was great, and I take that job over too, and then it comes time to do the next release. And we were big fans of what Vixie used to call eating your own dog food, and that meant that if we built the code, we ran the code, and we tested it. And I said, Dave, you know, I'm already, it's all built, but I don't have root access, you need to install all this so we can test it. He says, no problem, here's the root password. I didn't think anything about that. A few years go by, and we're now working on NTP version 4, and at one point I'm emailing with Dave's grad student about something we got to do, and the grad student says, oh, we, we can't do that until later because we need root access for that and nobody has it. I said, well, I have root access. And he paused, and he said, whoa. The only people who have root on Dave's machines are Dave and two of the people at the top of the food chain in campus IT. Nobody gets root on Dave's machine. I went, okay. So, uh, where am I going? Dave and I used to get into rare but intense fights on the mailing list over technical issues. I would get into rare but intense fights with Danny Mayer, a technical developer on NTP, on the mailing list, and Dave would occasionally get into rare but intense fights with a variety of other people, including Judah at NIST and the folks at US Naval Observatory and folks at PTB in Germany and a couple of other folks. 
And we never thought anything about these fights because, you know, it's just what we did. It was behavior we were all comfortable with. I subsequently learned that several people were quite disconcerted about these, these technical dust-ups. After one of my fights with Dave, I was chatting with his grad student, and I said, you know, Dave is fighting me really hard on this. I wonder if he doesn't like me. And his immediate reply was, Dave fights harder with you than with anybody I have ever seen before, and that includes what he does here on campus. He only fights with people he respects, and if he didn't respect you, he would ignore you. Oh, okay. So a little while later, I'm doing an email discussion with, with uh, maybe it was a phone call, with Miroslav Lichvar, who went on to write Crony, and Dave had just gotten into an email fight with Miroslav. And Miroslav says, you know, I wonder if Dave doesn't like me because he fights me so hard. And I said, I just learned something. Dave doesn't fight with people he doesn't respect. And Miroslav went, oh. <laughs> so that was cool. One of the people I met in the Eugene seminar was a guy named Ron Kurtz. And he was there with his future wife, Terry. And the people at the seminar told us they invited Ron because Ron was the founder of something called Hakomi Psychotherapy. And it's a school of psychotherapy that's founded on five principles. Organicity, mindfulness, nonviolence, mind-body holism, and unity. None of that made any sense to me. And I had no real idea what psychotherapy was. But Ron and I got along well, and we kept in touch over the years. After one of our chats, Ron said he thought I might really like to take one of his trainings. I believed him, and even though I had no idea what they were about, I was working a lot of hours and could use a vacation, so I went, sure, let me see what I can do. And he says, well, we meet for one month a year for two years. And I said, I can't do that. With my consulting schedule, somebody's going to call me up, I've got to fly somewhere, I'm going to miss these trainings. He went, okay. And in a few minutes, I will tell you how all of this applies to NTP. He calls me up and says, I'm doing a new training. We're going to meet for one month a year for three years. I can schedule a month off, so I sign up for this thing. I fly to Medford, Oregon for the training, where I meet the other 19 participants and probably 10 staffers for the very first time. Half of the, half of the participants turn out to be PhD psychotherapists. The other half are massage therapists. I still don't really know what psychotherapy is. And during the introductions at the first of the thing, the psychotherapists all say they're there because they were, Hakomi came into their sphere of awareness and they wanted to learn it and put it into their toolbox. All the massage therapists said they were aware of it and they noticed that when they're working on people in session, they may have emotional releases and they want to have the resourcefulness to be of, of assistance to somebody who's having a severe emotional release or something like that. And they get to me and I say, I'm here because I know Ron and he thinks I'll like it. And that's about the extent of it. At the end of the first day, I learned that psychotherapy is talk therapy. How's that for a revelation for somebody who's been on the planet for, you know, 30 some odd years? And I, on the end of the second day, I realized I've signed up for a training on how to learn to be a psychotherapist. I am not a psychotherapist. I have been trained in it, but I am not. So Hakomi integrates a number of different practices, including chaos theory, fractal theory, Buddhism, and general systems theory. And all this stuff ties in really well with all the computer stuff I'm doing. You've got chaos theory with jitter and noise and all the rest of it. You've got fractal theory because if you look at a problem and dive down into it, you end up seeing more and more complexity that has to be teased about and all the rest of it. And general systems theory is all about identifying feedback loops and cause and effect possibly with delays and all the rest of it. So it fits in really well with my desire to come up with ways to model stuff. So in this training, uh, so one of the things that happens in Hakomi is the therapist will go to the client and, and identify something that they know that, that they don't believe the client is aware of, and they will get the client into a state of mindfulness and awareness, and then bring up that thing to see what's noticed. And it's incredibly enlightening, and it's really useful, and that's the short summary of Hakomi, is evoked experience and mindfulness. One of the other th places 
we got there was uh, Richard Schwartz, a PhD psychotherapist in Chicago, independently came up with the awareness of fractals and general system theory and turned all that into how do we apply this into uh, psychotherapy. And he came out and, and did some guest talks every once in a while. The thing I like about fractals is I can look at me as a as an entity. I've got organs that do their own parts. If you go down to the cellular level, they do things. You've got DNA, you've got molecules, you've got atoms. It zooms down. Zooming up, there's how I interrelate with my partner, with my family, extended family, neighborhood, counties, it goes up. And fractals for me are a really wonderful way to zoom in and out, similarly to uh, NTP and the other issues of trying to tease signal from the noise, for lack of a better phrase. Back in the 80s, NTP was able to keep clocks on computers synced within a tenth of a second. And over the intervening years, we've gotten to the point where on a decent machine with a normal LAN, we can synchronize clocks to a millisecond. So we've gotten, yeah, we've, we've gotten an order or two of magnitude better just by paying attention and teasing things out and figuring out what to do with them better and better. Dave paid a lot of attention to make sure those things happen, and he did it in a way that when you combine it with a variety of external events, the wheels don't fly off the bus. So, but the news around that isn't all great. Back in the day, used to NIST used to synchronize their remote systems using Bell 212A modems and phone lines. And it was awesome because a Bell 212A modem is discrete components and it exhibits constant delay time regardless of what sort of data is in there. The phone wire are real copper wires, even if they're going through switches and things like that, so you've got constant delay that way too. And as we've gone to software modems and digitizing voice, it now means that the phone system is no good for, for accurate time synchronization anymore. There are other sources of noise that enter the mix. NTP syncs time, to my mind, in the heart of the system. And in order to communicate the time there, you've got to go through the operating system, kernel layers, user space. You've got interrupts. You've got all sorts of stuff. And it is, if you're going to exchange it from there with somebody else, you then have to go back down into the drivers, into the hardware, all the rest of it. And that's a, there, that's a lot of noise that is unknown. And it's jitter. It's going gonna, it's gonna to place a limit on how, how well you can transmit time. And then you get to the network interface which is going to go out on the wire, and you've got network delays and all the rest of it. So that's tough. Larry McVoy has a favorite, a favorite quote, which goes something like, in school, one studies various theories, and you'll often hear, assume a frictionless surface, and then go off and study the theory. The difference between school and industry is that in school, one pays attention to the theory, while in industry, one pays attention to the friction. In the fall of 95, I started what would become a two-year contract as a senior systems administrator for an insurance company. We want you to be here to do things in case they break. And I said, okay, so you want me to fix them? They said, no, we don't want you to fix them. We want you to be here in case we decide to fix them and how we're going to fix them. And it was weird, but I said, okay. And after I'd been there a couple of weeks, I realized this is an insurance company. I'm their insurance policy. Okay, I finish all my monitoring tools and the rest of it and say, what do you want me to do while, I have, while everything's humming along nicely? And they said, do whatever you want as long as it doesn't cost me money. So Dave Mills and I spent a lot of work those years and we got the last releases of NTP3 out the door and the first few alpha releases of NTP4. Somewhere in there, I was also contemplating the issues around communication and achieving consensus. How do, how do people change somebody's mind and get them to achieve consensus? I knew that there were a lot of destructive ways to do that, and it's called manipulation. So I heard about a book entitled Influencing with Integrity, and I went, there's a title I can get behind. I've got to read this and see what it's all about. So moving forward, 
we see the last alpha releases of NTP4, the beta releases of NTP4, and the first production release of NTP4. Dave never liked source code control. And uh, he said, and I finally got him to agree to it, and he said, it must be invisible to me, and if I ever see it, I'm going to yank it out by the roots. So I started off with, C I knew I didn't like RCS, picked CVS, looked at SVN, said no way, uh, and went with that. Larry McVoy had come up with BitKeeper by then, and I'd been talking to them, and after two years, I went ahead and switched to BitKeeper, it behaves the way I think, so I almost never have to go to the documentation, and it just works the way I want, and it's perfect for our work environment. At the, so those same times, I was looking for ways to people to support the NTP project. We didn't have any sort of legal entity around us, so people couldn't just give us money. I had to figure out a way to solve that. Um, in one of these places, in the previous slide, I mentioned the fifth discipline, Peter Senge's book. Halfway through the book, there's a section about open, uh, openness and complexity that talks about how f feedback relationships in intricate or complex systems get really nasty, which speaks a lot about NTP because you do something the wrong way, the wheels fly off the bus. That goes back to fractals and how to visualize and put these things together. I'm not going to read this to you, but it's in the slide, so if anybody cares, they can go back and get it. The, the, the example I was really looking for that I couldn't find is that if you get a bunch of people together, groups of people together, who are trying to solve a problem, there can be a real issue of A, people don't communicate openly and honestly, and B, if there are significant stakeholders who are not present. And if someone says, we're trying to you know, provide food to these people, and group A says, well, we've got the food, we could only do it, we could do it if this group would only do this next piece, and that's easy. And that group stands up and says, no, it's not easy, we can't do that until this other group does their piece, which should be easy. And that group stands up and says, no, that isn't easy, there's these other things. It becomes a real tangle and you gotta break through that, that log jam. Another, another situation of Examples like this are, say, women's health care in the U.S., or water quality in Detroit or Jackson, Mississippi, or the Texas power grid, or infrastructure in Puerto Rico or something like that. I hope I just didn't get too political. So also in there, the PTP standard came up. And PTP works because they put a clock at the end of the NIC chip, and if you have clocks at the end of each NIC chip and wires between them, there's no jitter, there's no delay, and there's nothing getting in the way between these things exchanging time. And for normal use, I'm told you can get that down to three, four nanoseconds. If you're somebody like White Rabbit at CERN, where they put a whole lot of work into these things, and they will do physics experiments between, I think, Switzerland and Italy, they can get sub-nanosecond accuracy and picoseconds of precision out of precision time protocol. PTP switches cost about a hundred times more per port than a normal Ethernet switch. So PTP is not something that's going to be widely deployable soon. The other aspect of that is people, and their, people run only time on their timing networks. They don't do anything else. My understanding was that you may recall that a few years ago, they did an experiment where they thought they may have demonstrated something worked faster than time, uh, faster than the speed of light. And that upset, a that concerned a bunch of people. The labs, the restricted access labs where they do this stuff, they take pictures of everything. When you walk in the room, when you do something, and when you leave the room, you got pictures of everything. In pouring over the results, the BNC connectors for this have a registration mark on both the jack and the plug. They found one plug that, had, that was set at 90 degrees and wasn't snapped up. When they snapped it up, their error went away and you know, the speed of light was, was reconfirmed again. So it was moving closer because I'm almost out of time. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this self-serving stuff I did with GNU, AutoConf, and AutoMake, even though it goes, the, the bottom line is I ended up uh, doing the build chain for the MDS, what became the MDS switch series. I don't know what a fabric switch is. 
but I can I got the build tool chain for it and I, and they can do all that fun stuff. Uh, that was cool. The trick is I still haven't wrapped my brain around non-recursive make stuff. So I finished my Cisco contract in December of 2004 and my ex, soon to be ex and I decided that we should do a driving trip. That was lovely. Um, I got back from that trip and asked Paul Vixie if I could mooch some space from him at ISC for a desk and he went, sure. They'd already been hosting a rack for the NTP project, so it meant I could easily get into the rack and do fun things. I met Margaret in 2005, and I was glad she lived in Southern Oregon, because if I got to drive six hours away from the Bay, I'd rather drive six hours north to Oregon than, forgive me, six hours south to Los Angeles. Somewhere in the 2009 or 2010 All Hands meeting at ISC, they did a Seven Habits training which was great. At the bottom of the seven habits, they said, the seven habits are based on a foundation of good character. Everybody agreed to that. And what I noticed was, while it's true, people have different definitions of good character. So that ties into what I was talking about before. And I had an organizational home, and we could do fun things. Right after that, uh, Vixie just announced that he wanted to go off and do other different things, which was cool. But it also meant that they were going to stop fund their non -fund unfunded mandates, which was us. The rack was safe, my office was not. So I shifted and I moved to the rest of it. And to quickly wrap up, because I've got like a minute or so, um, I decided this, I didn't want to do an NTP foundation because that was focused on NTP. I wanted to do a network time foundation because the, issue, the big issue there is synchronizing time over networks. So I started NTF, I got the paperwork, I got some money. There was a whirlwind trip to get the paperwork to the expediters in California, pick it up, go to, Oreg go to the Oregon State Capitol, get the registration, drive right down to the bank, open the account so I can talk to our first supporters and they can wire money to us for the trip. It, it was a session. So let's see what's next. Couple more sayings along the way. Um, they're fun. There will be suckage. It's a nice, easy way to do things. Um, another one I realized is that I'm always happy to work with people of good character who are competent and collaborative. And the other thing I will say is uh, zooming ahead. One of the other things Samuel Johnson wrote that I really like is integrity without knowledge is weak and useless. Knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. And I pay attention to that because it brings me to my next interesting point. Signal to noise ratio people are used to. The really important one to me is information attitude ratio. If you're coming at me with information, I'm good. If you come at me with attitude, I can be less resourceful. So here we go. Uh, I form Network Time Foundation. We've got a bunch of stuff, and I'm really sorry that I rambled on about something a bit longer because I really wanted to mention more about NTP and, and the Kronos project and Linux PTP and Synky frequency transfer and spew a bit about the general timestamp API because timestamps are useless. A, you know, a 32 or 64 bit timestamp, there's not much you can do with that. There's no meta information about it. You don't know what time scale it was taken in. You don't know what errors it has, not, nothing. You can't even easily move it to another system. But if you have a fatter timestamp with more useful information in it, you can move that around. You can, you can convert it to other time scales. You can compare it. You can do useful things, you can embed it into SQL databases, and life is good. So I think I'm down to about, well, I'm just going to do it this way. This was one that I heard, and a company told me, a company I heard about read the Taos Farmer stories, and the management had a decree, from now on, now on we will no longer have problems. We will only have opportunities. And not long after that, a worker told their manager, I need help with an insurmountable opportunity. So there we are. 
and uh, I really appreciate being invited to speak here, and I would say I hope there are some questions, but I'm over by two minutes, so. Thank mm -hmm. you.